Um, let's get started. Uh, th first of all, thank you all for attending, um, for coming to this uh, very important uh, talk. So let me start with the acknowledgement that the University of Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, made up of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. Um, I'm very pleased today to, to introduce um, Dr. Chile Iboa Osuji. Um, Dr. Iboa Osuji is the current holder of the Paul Martin Senior Chair in Political Science, Law, and Interna International Relations here at the University of Windsor. Uh, the holder of this chair is um, appointed jointly by the Faculty of Law and the Department of Political Science and holds the position for a two-year term. As holder of this position, Dr. Iboa uh, Osuji um, teaches uh, one class for law and one class for political science. And so students in both areas have uh, basically a priceless opportunity, opportunity to learn from someone uh, with almost unmatched experience in the field of international law. So let me turn to that experience now. Uh, when we started the process of making the current appointment, uh, the Dean of Law at the time, Dr. Chris Waters, uh, said to me that uh, Dr. Iboa Osuji is a big deal. And I don't think I appreciated uh, how much of a big deal until I started reading his resume. So let me highlight a couple of points now and, and noting that this is only uh, some of the highlights from that resume. It's not going to do full justice to uh, the experience that Dr. Uh, Iboa Osuji brings to the position. In 2012, Dr. Iboa Osuji took up a seat on the International Criminal Court, um, a seat that he held for nine years. Uh, the last three of which uh, as president of the ICC. Uh, prior to joining the ICC, Dr. Iboa Osuji served as legal advisor to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, based in Geneva. He has also been a member of the International Criminal Court for Rwanda and an appeals judge on the Special Court for Sierra Leone. He has an extensive record of legal scholarship and publications, including the books entitled International Law and Sexual Violence in Armed Conflicts and Protecting Humanity. He is also the author of, of countless uh, articles on various aspects of international law, and he is the editor-in-chief of the Nigerian Yearbook of International Law. Since leaving uh, the post of president of the International Criminal Court, Dr. Iboa Osuji has taken up a position as visiting professor at Stanford, Stanford Law School, a senior fellow at Harvard University, as well as distinguished international jurist at Ryerson Law School and special advisor to the president of Ryerson. So did I mention that Dr. Iboa Osuji is a big deal? Um, I'm delighted that he is here today uh, with us to deliver a talk on international law uh, after the Ukraine invasion. Uh, we are all too aware, unfortunately, that uh, the crisis unfolding in Ukraine makes this an all too relevant topic. So Dr. Iboa Osuji will talk to us for approximately uh, 50 minutes. Um, and I then we'll have a period of about 30 minutes uh, just a little bit longer, perhaps, for questions and answers. So I will ask you to, uh, to hold your questions for that period. And then, um, uh, as I will remind you, when the time comes, uh, the easiest mechanism is to, to raise your hand in the functions so that I can identify you uh, and, and turn to you for your question. Uh, until then, for the time being, could you turn off your, your mics and your camera? as that will uh, facilitate the meeting. So again, it's with great pleasure that I turn the floor over to Dr. Uh, Chile Eboha Usuji. Sorry, excuse me, I did really well until the end. <laughs> Chile, <laughs> over to you. Thank you very much, John. Chile Eboha Usuji here. And it's a great, great honor um, to, to be um, back in Canada after <clears throat> very many years of absence. I used to practice law 
in in Toronto. It was from here that I started the my journey, and then took me through as um, Dr. Sutcliffe mentioned, working at various tribunals, including as um, senior appeals counsel in the special court for Sierra Leone. Um, now. Um, earlier this month, uh, on the 17th of March 2022, I delivered the um, David Goodman Lecture at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, titled A Phoenix Moment, International Law After Ukraine. Now, you can see the similarity between the title of that one and this, but I promise you that that's going to be a repeat. Uh, on that occasion, I told the story of how wars have given the greatest impetus to the development of international law. And I traced the arc of that phenomenon through sundry wars, mostly fought in Europe, dating back to the 80 years and the 30 years wars, both of which ended uh, in 1648 with the signing of the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, most, uh, moving the, uh, closer to our own times, uh, we also saw the same phenomenon of international uh, development of international law um, operating in more uh, recent wars, such as the Second World War of the 1940s, and even the Balkan Wars and the Rwandan Civil War of the 19. 90s. And I urged that the current pain of Ukrainians must not go to waste uh, in the aftermath of Mr. Putin's horrid, heart wrenching invasion of that storied nation in another disheartening war of the 21st century. I urged that as major wars are done in the past, this one should also result in the further strengthening or development of international law. In that regard, I urged that two things, two adjustments uh, needed to be made in international law, only two adjustments, mind you. Uh, the first is to amend the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in order to give the UN General Assembly the power to refer cases to the ICC uh, when the veto power had been exercised at the Security Council to block such referral from the Security Council to the ICC. That was one uh, proposal on the table. The second one is to, uh, the, the time has come now to adopt an international covenant on the right to peace in order that victims of wars of aggression should be enabled to pursue civil claims against states and individuals who unleash wars of aggression and as well as commercial enterprises who knowingly aid those wars in violation of the victim's right to peace. Now, why amend the Rome Statute uh, in order to allow the GA the privilege of referring cases to the ICC, you may ask? Uh, I shall return to that question in a little more detail later. But first of all, let's take another question uh, of, a, of the same kind. And that is, why must peace be recognized as a fundamental human right? Let me show you why. I'm going to share a screen, if you don't mind. All right, now I'm going to
How can you enjoy any of those rights that international law now recognizes as fundamental human rights in circumstances like what we've seen on screen in law, in the law of litigation, we call that showing the stump of injury. So we will continue that discussion that we started. I started at the Goodman Lecture today. But before we do that, um, before we proceed, uh, we must be clear-eyed about a certain obstacle to these proposals that seem so simple. To be sure, these two proposals, particularly the proposal to amend the Rome Statute, will, not may, will provoke very stiff disapproval from all those nations who have benefited so far from the cynical abuse of the veto power at the UN Security Council. But in that regard, I must urge all states to heed the counsel of the US Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, who went on to serve as the US representative at the London Conference of 1945 and later as the U.S. Chief Prosecutor at Nuremberg. Uh, this is what he said in April 1945, before he took on those international functions. Quote, We cannot successfully cooperate with the rest of the world in establishing a reign of law unless we are prepared to have that law sometimes operate against what we would consider to be our national advantage." Unquote. Now, beyond that observation, that is all in our interest to support the rule of law, even when it works against us. Beyond that, the objection against the proposal to amend the Rome Statute in the suggested way underscores one thing. It underscores that individual criminal accountability is a dread prospect to even the most powerful strongman leaders in the world. And it is precisely for that reason that the amendment should be made. Now, during the second week of this invasion in Ukraine, I was listening to a short uh, radio documentary on a French radio station, I think it was France Couture. The documentary was looking at how the Ukrainian population was coping. The sense of fatalism was all too palpable even as a population were determined to defend their country. There was this woman who was interviewed and she said this, I have had a good life. I have had fun. So far, I have had a life that allowed me to do whatever I wanted to do. Now, I am ready to die, unquote. But ladies and gentlemen, the lady who said that was only 28 years old. That is less than half my age. And I think there is still plenty to do in life, including what I'm urging you that we should do about this phenomenon of war. So that is what it came down for humanity, our humanity in Ukraine people even 28 years old are now prepared to die if that is what must happen. There are many reasons why this picture is horribly wrong in the 21st century. Now, they include what I'm going to uh, describe now, this, this scenario. Think about this, reflect on this for a minute, if you can. On the 7th of October 1952, a child was born in what is now St. Petersburg, 
Then it was called Leningrad. It was a boy. He came into the world naked, like every other child born on earth, naked the same way that all the civilians who have now died in the invasion of Ukraine came into the world. That little boy born in Leningrad in 1952, his mother was a factory worker and his father a conscript in the Soviet army. They were not royalty. Not that it should matter whether or not they were royalty. But guess what the humble couple named their baby boy? I'm sure you can. They named him Vladimir. His parents no doubt loved him as the parents of Ivan, a little boy only weeks old, who was killed early on in the invasion of Ukraine, loved their own boy. Now, what would give that earlier child of another mother, Vladimir Putin, the right to decide to unleash death and destruction upon countless innocent civilians of Ukraine and their livelihoods, merely because he turned out to be the head of state of Russia 69 years later? And why should the international order of things accept that? Accept it as um, if we are destined forever to live under such arrangements, where the only choices left to those civilians, victims of that war of aggression, are fight him, surrender to him, abandon the lives in Ukraine and escape to other countries, or resign to die at his instance. And I ask this of our humanity. Are we but just a flock of docile sheep programmed to accept this wholly senseless arrangement because our so-called national leaders and policymakers find that it serves their interest and their convenience to let things be that way? These are not original thoughts from me, you see. Uh, nor is the idea really radical as such. Let us recall that in 1919, the eyes of the world were set on Paris at the end of the First World War to settle the terms of that war just concluded. At that conference, one great man said these words, and I quote, we are here to see, in short, that the very foundations of this war are swept away. These foundations were the private choices of small coteries of civil rulers and military staffs. Those foundations were the aggression of great powers upon the small. Those foundations were the holding together of empires of unwilling subjects by the duress of arms. Those foundations were the power of small bodies of men to work their will upon mankind and use them as pawns in a game. And nothing less than the emancipation of the world from these things will accomplish peace." Unquote. The great man who spoke those words was the US President Woodrow Wilson. He was no radical, only a visionary. The foundations of war in 2022 remain what they were in 1914 when the First World War started. The private choice of small coteries of civil rulers and military staffs, the aggression of great powers upon the small, the holding together of empires of unwilling subjects of the duress, uh, by the duress of arms, 
the power of small bodies of men to work their will upon mankind and use them as pawns in a game. And nothing less than the emancipation of the world from these things, said Wilson, will accomplish peace. 103 years later, I stand on his authority in asking this. If power belongs to the people, is it not time then for the people of the world, beginning with us here today, to insist that our leaders must adjust international law and make clear that the job of the people that Wilson described as a small coterie of civil rulers is only to make life better for our shared humanity and not inflict death and destruction and general misery upon innocent human beings just for their own aggrandizement as leaders. Indeed, the job of heads of state or a head of state is a difficult job, but the world richly rewards the office holder with all manner of honor and privilege. Uh, there's a catchy French song um, one would see in the uh, French musical Romeo et Juliet. It goes like this. Les rois du monde vivent au sommet. Ils ont la plus belle vue, mais y'a un mais. The kings of the world live on top of the world. They've got the best views, but there is a but. We're now in the 21st century. Is it time then to liberate humanity from the anachronistic vestiges of life in the dark ages when kings and emperors had the extrajudicial power of life and death over the fellow human beings? That is what the war in Ukraine today is really all about. Is it time to expand the range of consequences that must be visited upon heads of state who unleash a war of aggression? We expand those consequences by making those two adjustments that I suggested, amend the Rome Statute and adopt an international covenant on the right to peace. Now, let me return to the question I left hanging. Why amend the Rome Statute? Uh, in this explaining that the currently the authority to refer cases to the ICC, cases of wars of aggression to the ICC, where the aggressor state is not a member state of the um, International Criminal Court. Such referrals could only be made by the United Nations Security Council. Now, the problem with that is that the UN Security Council has five permanent member states, each of which holds a veto power to veto any proposal or work of the United Nations Security Council in its primary function of maintaining international peace and security. The five permanent members include Russia course, and Russia is not a member state of the Rome Statute. You can then not have the Security Council refer a case to the ICC because Russia will veto such referral. It will be dead on arrival. But if it is possible to amend the Rome Statute that allows mentions only the UN Security Council as a power within the UN that could refer cases to the ICC, if the amendment can be made to open it up so that the United Nations General Assembly itself can also make a referral to the ICC where the Security Council is blocked from doing so by way of a veto power, then you would have the prospect that a United Nations General Assembly can use what they call the Uniting for Peace procedure 
to refer cases to the ICC. Uniting for Peace procedure was adopted by the UN in 1950 that enables the United Nations General Assembly to take over and do what the UN Security Council should have done in the first place, but someone used the veto power, a veto power to block it. So that is a possibility only if the member states of the Rome Statute can make that referral to the ICC. And that is why it is urged, and it is only for state parties to the ICC to take up that question and run with it. The UN General Assembly, sorry, UN Security Council cannot have, it does not have veto power about the amendments to the Rome Statute, so that amendment can be made. Now, you may have noticed that I've been focusing in this part on the crime of aggression. I've mentioned it and I need to uh, return to it and explain uh, what that's all about. Uh, the crime of aggression, let's keep in mind, is different from war crime. There's a specific regime for the crime of aggression. It's not the same as a war crime. The crime of aggression occurs where one state that has not been attacked then decides to launch the first attack. A state that has neither been attacked nor is about to be attacked decides to open up um, a warfare by striking first. That is the uh, uh, war of aggression. And a war of aggression is a crime in international law. We tend to um, speak about it internationally in the terms of a use um, ad bellum, use ad bellum meaning the war as such, the war as such, just the war. Now, that's different from war crime. The war crime is um, basically the crime that is committed uh, in the conduct of a war. That crime could be attacking civilian populations, um, killing innocent people, even abusing prisoners of war, uh, prisoners captured from the forces that are invading your territory. You should not um, they become prisoners of war, they are not to be mistreated. So that is the crime of aggression. It is different from, uh, sorry, that's a war crime. That's different from a crime of aggression. But of course, the aggressor state compounds its circumstances by also possibly committing war crimes on top of the crime already of aggression that that state has committed. Now, what is the crime of aggression? Let's kind of zero in a bit on that. Uh, in Latin, that is, again, we speak about it in terms of um, use, I said, use ad bellum being the, the war as such. Uh, the war crime is, we say, we describe in Latin as use in bello, meaning um, the, uh, the war as um, fought, I suppose, the war as such being used at bellum. What is the definition then of the crime of aggression? Here, the UN General Assembly was of much help in 1974, when it adopted a resolution that we call Resolution 3314, Roman 29, that is XSIX. Resolution 3314, bracket XXIX of 1974. In that resolution, the, security, uh, the, the UN General Assembly defined aggression as, quote, the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state, or in any other manner inconsistent with the charter of the United Nations, as explained in the resolution, unquote. Uh, that was Article 1 of the um, Resolution 3314. Then in Article 3, the resolution identifies a number of conducts that um, qualify as acts of uh, aggression, uh, regardless of declaration of war, whether or not a state has declared war, whether you choose to call it police operation or special operation or whatever you choose to call it, there are certain conducts that when they're engaged or committed, that will amount to a crime, uh, act of aggression. Uh, these include many of them, about 
12, I believe, but uh, the, for present purposes, uh, let's look at four of those. Item, quote, the invasion or attack by the armed forces of a state of the territory of another state or any military occupation, however temporary, resulting from such invasion or attack or any annexation of the use, uh, uh, sorry, any annexation by the use of force of the territory of another state or part thereof, unquote. Now, from all indications, Russia's conduct fits this definition. Next item, quote, bombardment by the armed forces of a state against the territory of another state or the use of any weapons by a state against the territory of another state, unquote. Again, from all indications, uh, the uh, conduct of Russia in Ukraine would fit that definition. Next item, quote, an attack by the armed forces of a state on the land, sea or air forces or marine and air fleet of another state, unquote. Then again, what's happening in Ukraine fits that. And the last four, the, the fourth one, not as I said, um, this is not all of them, but I just picked four to explain. The fourth one I'm going to look at would be, quote, the use of armed forces of one state, which are within the territory of another state, with the agreement of the receiving state, in contravention of the conditions provided for in the agreement or any extension of their presence in such territory, beyond the termination of the agreement, unquote. In other words, you have a state who agreed with another, okay, you can come stay on our territory, bring your troops and for whatever purpose under certain terms. But then the state that's invited in and it now decides to um, contravene the conditions of that agreement and basically uh, turn the um, invitation into a hostile conduct that is an act of aggression according to the UN definition of the term. Again, um, what happened in Crimea would fit that bill as you, you would have known uh, that uh, Sebastopol, the, the, the port, um, was being leased by uh, Russia. But then in, in 2014, Russia decided to annex Crimea. So that would fit that definition of the crime of aggression. Now, the Rome Statute has incorporated these provisions into its own core definition of the crime of aggression. I thought I should note that, except that the Rome Statute cannot now be um, activated against Russia because um, we require only the Security Council to make that referral and Russia will block it. Let's return to Article, uh, sorry, Resolution 3314. Um, for some, certain critical considerations that we need to keep in mind in assessing what's going on in Ukraine in this in this war. One of them is this, and I quote, uh, there's an important provision in Resolution 3314, says here, quote, no consideration of whatever nature, whether political, economic, military, or otherwise may serve as a justification for aggression. I'll take that again. No consideration of whatever nature, whatever, whether political, economic, military, or otherwise may serve as a justification for aggression. Notably, and unsurprisingly, the same resolution provides that a war of aggression is a crime against international peace. The war of aggression is a crime against international peace, says the UN uh, General Assembly resolution. And the resolution um, uh, continues to say that the crime of aggression or the war of aggression gives rise to international responsibility. Aggression gives rise to international responsibility. Now, the significance of that um, observation, of that um, norm, that the war of aggression gives rise to international responsibility, it's not merely that in 1972, 
the UN General Assembly was foreshadowing that in 1998, the uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court will come along and um, um, make aggression criminal. In other words, international criminal responsibility in those terms. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the 1974 uh, resolution of the UNGA uh, had in mind that um, development of international law since 1919 and more immediately in 1945 had accepted that um, a war of aggression is crime, is, is criminal conduct in international law. But beyond that, what was being contemplated by when the resolution says that um, the, the war of aggression gives rise to international responsibility includes um, civil reparation of the state, the aggressor state needs to make against the victim state that, that, that suffered the aggression, that you will have uh, what we call international law, uh, international uh, state responsibility. The implication of that is, after all said and done, uh, the state whose armed forces have engaged in that war of aggression will be on the hook for reparation in international law. That is to say, from what we are seeing, uh, of course, we have to make allow room here for judges to make final pronouncements. But as intelligent human beings, uh, we can hazard a guess of where things uh, are likely to go. And that is that when all this is said and done, Russia is on the hook to Ukraine in for reparations he needs to make for the crime uh, for the invasion of Ukraine as a result of the, uh, in, the international responsibility that is now provoked by that uh, invasion. Now, apart from those consequences we've seen, war, uh, crime of aggression, uh, sorry, uh, a war of aggression is an international crime that gives rise to um, responsibility in international law and that there's no justification whatsoever for a war or for aggression, be it military, political, and otherwise. Apart from those observations or those norms stated in Resolution 3314, another important um, norm stated in that resolution is this, quote, no territorial acquisition or special advantage resulting from aggression is or shall be recognized as lawful. You know where that's going. No territorial acquisition or special advantage resulting from aggression is or shall be recognized as lawful. That was the norm stated by the United Nations General Assembly back in 1974. And what that now means is that beyond the particular odium of criminality that the invasion of Ukraine portends, it is also the case that any territory annexed by Russia as a result of this invasion cannot be recognized in international law as lawful and in international relations as lawful. That also no doubt goes for the annexation of Crimea back in 2014. As long as, as far as international law is concerned, those remain illegalities that cannot be recognized in international law and international relations. So we don't know where all this madness is really, really going. What well, uh, was that in mind? But in, on that subject of where the madness is really, really going or what was that in mind, uh, we come to the, some of the um, purported uh, justifications offered for the invasion of Ukraine. Um, we had the president of um, Russia, Mr. Putin, say, oh, well, the reason why we're, one of the reasons why we're doing this, we need to go in and denazify Ukraine, uh, denazification. Now, some have suggested that that allegation may be appraised in light of the involvement of some 
far-right extremists known as the Assov Battalion, uh, whose Wolfgangel um, um, insignia uh, resembles very, very closely the insignia of the um, Hitler's SS units um, during the Second World War. So that is one argument that has been made. But the dominant view from those who do not accept that kind of rationale is that uh, the, the denazification claim is perversely absurd because uh, Mr. Putin directed it at the cabal, he said, or the regime uh, at the helm of Ukrainian government. And when you look at it, the man at the helm of that regime is President Zelensky, who is Jewish. So you cannot uh, readily entertain the proposition that he was a Nazi or associated with Nazi behavior. It may also be pointed out that uh, Mr. Putin did precisely, I mean, part of the per per perverseness of, of the argument is that he, in invading Ukraine, he did exactly what Hitler and Stalin did respectively on the 1st and the 17th of September 1939, when they invaded Poland, um, not, uh, the, the, the uh, Nazi regime from the West on the 1st of September 1939. And eventually, by an agreement, um, Stalin from the East on the 17th of September 1939. Without belaboring the point, and we only have limited time for this lecture, one would say that that is uh, quite a uh, perverse irony to be to have done what was done in 1939 in relation to Ukraine. You do that in 19, uh, sorry, in 2022, and you uh, claim you are denazifying the country. But again, we don't want to spend too much time on that. At any rate, it would be, um, even if we had to take that charge in its best light, even if we had to accept it as face value and it, um, take it uh, uh, um, at best value, the question is, does that, that kind of allegation legally justify the invasion of Ukraine? The answer is no. This is primarily because the UN General Assembly 3314, as we've seen earlier, says that, quote, no consideration of whatever nature, whether political, economic, military, or otherwise may serve as a justification for aggression. That remains the norm. Now, keep that in mind while we look at another argument that uh, Mr. Putin has thrown into the into the pile as justifying the, uh, the invasion. He, he, he says that, well, in addition to the Nazification claim, the other claim was that um, ethnic Russians in the Donbass uh, region of Ukraine, uh, in Luhansk and Donetsk, um, down towards the south around the Crimea area, had been victims of um, a genocide. In effect, the argument is that his invasion of Ukraine was a humanitarian intervention resulting from a need to denazify the country and stop an ongoing genocide. Now, unsurprisingly, the argument has provoked a torrent of protests from people who thought the comparison would diminish the epochal depravity um, of the Holocaust. I approach the matter myself from a different angle and recognizing from that angle that genocide is a horrible crime. And indeed, the um, height of it of uh, human history in modern times have seen has been the Holocaust. But genocide uh, is often a crime that tends to be committed 
under the cover of war uh, because those who engage in that conduct will say, well, yes, uh, there's an armed conflict. And when there's a war, uh, people get killed and people don't ask too many questions later on. Uh, that's what happens in war. Therefore, um, you know, sneak in and uh, commit genocide. So that has been known to happen in the context of armed conflict. It happened in Rwanda and, uh, and other wars. Now, keeping that in mind, um, again, from the perspective of the involvement of the um, the, the neo-Nazi, you know, more extreme right-wing um, extremists in, in, in the war, you might want to say, oh, well, well, let's keep our, an open mind on the charge of allegation. Well, indeed, there's a need to keep an open mind, again, mindful that people can commit genocide under the cover of an armed conflict, an ongoing armed conflict. But that, ladies and gentlemen, most quickly add, does not end the story in Ukraine. And that point must really, really be stressed. And here is why it needs to be stressed. Um, international law, as we know it, has now recognized ways of raising concerns and challenging states that whose conducts uh, may be said to violate the convention against genocide. We have seen uh, legal processes being used to engage that kind of inquiry. And the um, Mr. Putin's regime did not do that in relation to Ukraine. In 1993, for instance, the um, Bosnia-Herzegovina commenced litigation against Serbia and Montenegro, alleging that Serbia in particular had been complicit in genocide against um, Bosnian Muslims. So that was litigation that the international law allows states to make to engage that inquiry and Bosnia has a governor launched such, such a litigation against um, Serbia and Montenegro. More recently in 2019, the small country in West Africa called the Gambia commenced um, proceedings at the International Court of Justice against Myanmar, charging that Myanmar government and forces had been implicated in genocide against Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Again, that is something that international law opens up, uh, leaves states open to do, to challenge um, concerns about, uh, challenge states who, whose conducts allegedly um, lead to the suspicion that they've been involved in, in genocide. Again, Russia did not do that. Now, what did Russia do? Nothing. But it was Ukraine itself that actually commenced proceedings at the International Court of Justice um, a few, I think, four, three, four days after the commencement of this invasion in 2022, February. Ukraine now itself went to the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, and said, we're now submitting litigation to the ICJ to engage that question that um, Russia had now raised that our government has been implicated in genocide. Here it now is the opportunity for Russia to come to the international court and present the evidence to show that yes, indeed, the allegation was made out. Russia refused to show up. They did not come to the litigation. The litigation commenced and the um, Ukrainians immediately launched uh, a request for interim measures, meaning tell all sides, okay, hold your fire while the um, litigation is uh, looked into, the, the inqu judicial inquiry is made. So Ukraine commenced a litigation and then filed that request for interim measure immediately because all hell had already broken loose in Ukraine, the Russia shooting. Um, 
that that's what validated the, uh, the request for urgent interim measure. And because of the urgency of the matter, the ICJ scheduled hearing on the case uh, in five days from the point that Ukraine made the request and communicated that to the Russian embassy in The Hague for Russia to show up and argue its own side of the case. Uh, Russia did not show up, rather they communicated to the court. The ambassador said, well, um, five days is way too short to do all that needs to be done um, to present a proper case, so we cannot come. They did not propose an alternative date to show up that's more reasonable to them. Uh, they didn't. Yeah, but you like to think that, well, here was a country that unleashed an armed conflict against another. Uh, putting, basically, um, putting the lives of, at the minimum, its own soldiers at risk because they will be shot at too, uh, at the minimum, let alone the greater calamity of um, death and displacement of civilians. You unleash that on the thesis that you have evidence that genocide was being committed. But then when the question came up for you to present your evidence, uh, time is too short for us to show up and argue the case. And the state who is the victim of this conduct, who would have been surprised by your move, uh, in court arguing, bring your evidence, they are not in a better position to challenge your evidence that you are to make that case. So this is what needs to be kept in mind here. When I say it's not enough for Russia to say, well, um, there may have been the uh, assault battalion implicated in, in the conduct, in the, in, in the uh, armed conflict in the Donbass region, and there is um, genocide they are committing or whoever against Russian ethnics. That's why we went in. That's not the end of the question. There has to be proper evidence presented and there's a proper procedure to follow in doing that. And Russia did not do that. So the argument about the, nat the nazification and the argument about genocide um, remains one that Russia has not been able to make out in the meantime, although the opportunities to make that case had uh, been given to it or presented to it. So that's it. Now, the other argument they've made to support the invasion is, we've heard this many times, the, the NATO expansion uh, objection. Uh, it's a long running, strong, long suffering objection from Russia and threatening that if that project continued, uh, it will end badly. Um, so it, it needed to be aborted. Now I call this the, the NATO expansion factor. Uh, it may be recalled that the NATO expansion has been happening since 1999 after the uh, fall of the, um, um, the, the, the Iron Curtain. Uh, began in 1999 with Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. Continued in 2004 with the Baltic states. Uh, and Baltic states, um, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and as well as Romania and Bulgaria, all in 2004. And in, in 2008, NATO issued its um, famous, by some accounts of some people, infamous Budapest Declaration of Intent to also enroll Georgia and Ukraine. Now, Russia considered that a step too far, apparently, and immediately after that, they basically pummeled um, Georgia uh, to make their point that no way are you going to join NATO. Now, one big, and then they are in 2022, uh, clobbering again um, Ukraine. Of course, one big elephant in the room is uh, does, and all of this, is any role there, is there any blame uh, upon uh, NATO for seeking to expand? So that's one big question, and it's been raging in North America against international relations uh, experts. Um, some have spoken uh, with different degrees of um, uh, a school of camp, they call them the realist school, different degrees of blame. 
have said yes, the NATO expansion has something to do with this invasion. Some have qualified it as uh, the principal uh, reason for the invasion was that. And others have said, uh, in the opposite side, said absolute nonsense. So we cannot, uh, you know, broke the possibility of ever allowing Russia off the hook for this invasion by suggesting in any way that NATO expansion had anything to do with it. Now, I uh, don't want to dwell too much on that. Uh, if there's any question at the end of the lecture, I'll be happy to take it on the NATO expansion factor. Specifically, I'm interested in discussing, if possible, whether the the, the clamor to raise military budgets in countries like Germany and other NATO states is truly warranted by the invasion of Ukraine. That's some question. Uh, is there a continuing value for NATO, given that the original uh, purpose of NATO was to protect the, the Western world from the, 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 the sweep of uh, communism, especially uh, by violent, uh, by armed force? So NATO was set up to, to counter that. Now, given that Russia has effectively joined the capitalist world, as it were, uh, is there still a role for NATO? And if so, what? Again, that's one question that this whole thing has thrown up in the air. And I'm happy to venture a view on that if asked. And it is also uh, whether the um, NATO factor should trouble should be a concern that people should have those who are now trying to set up uh, a special um, tribunal to try Mr. Putin for the crime of aggression in Ukraine since the ICC cannot try him. So there's a question whether the argument about NATO expansion should trouble that project of creating a special tribunal again, but I do not want to dwell on those for now. If those questions come up, during the q and I'll be happy to take them. Now, but whatever happens to the debate on the NATO expansion factor, does um, NATO bear the blame or not? Um, again, the two camps who have vigorously uh, argued that and argued it um, even as we speak, whatever, however you settle that, let's assume even that one can say yes, um, NATO expansion uh, is truly, truly problematic, unequivocally so, um, to all intents and purposes. The question then becomes, can that really justify the invasion of Ukraine as a legal matter? As opposed to a political question. As a legal question, can the NATO expansion justify the invasion of Ukraine. In asking that question, we need to be very careful about the political rationalizations uh, in the realms of the law, uh, because some of these uh, considerations can come uh, perilously close to asking the victim of rape why she was dancing so provocatively at the nightclub in a dangerous part of town. So that is um, something to, to keep in mind. But it's enough to say for now that those arguments, those rationalizations, those hypotheses and theories are all political questions that must not obscure the controlling legal considerations. And as a matter of law, the question is this, um, as I said, does the, the invasion, is it warranted or justifiable in international law? I give four answers to that question. And I, in my view, I, I insist that they control. The legal question controls uh, the discussion from my perspective here. The first consideration is that and this is the first consideration why that argument uh, cannot uh, justify the invasion, or the NATO argument cannot justify the invasion of Ukraine, was that Ukraine in international law enjoys the right of self-determination. That is a right recognized in international law, is a right 
recognized since 1919, the Paris Peace Conference, when President Woodrow Wilson proposed it as a norm and it was embraced, uh, supported since then, and has now been received into international law by way of a countless number of United Nations instruments uh, that have since crystallized that right of self-determination. One of the principal documents of the UN uh, in this is a document that's called, uh, well, first of all, you, you see it in Article 1, um, Paragraph 2 of the United Nations Charter, recognizes the right to self-determination. And that right has been elaborated upon in a document called the Declaration of the principles of international law concerning friendly relations and cooperation amongst states. Uh, it was adopted in 1970 by the UN General Assembly. So uh, these instruments have crystallized a state's right to self-determination. So Ukraine has that right. And that right to self-determination uh, entitles it to associate itself with whomever it wishes to, the state wants to associate with, and however it wants to do that uh, in its capacity as a sovereign state. That is the right the Ukraine has in international law. Now, there is a second argument I have here, and that argument um, goes to a right that Russia does not have in international law. Russia does not have the right to use any state as a buffer, as a security buffer against another state or against an alliance with another state. No state has that right to say, well, you are our neighbor, you're so close to us that because you're so close to us, you have to be neutral. You cannot be um, aligned with a, 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 you know, an arrangement we consider uh, a threat to us. That is not a recognized right in international law. And it cannot, that consideration, it may be political, but it cannot cancel out the right to self-determination that Ukraine has. So that's my second argument. The third argument um, implicates the, the notion of self-defense that has been uh, implicated in uh, that, that Mr. Putin has hinted at or even um, argued largely. And that is associated, of course, with the uh, anti-NATO um, concern that he has, uh, self-defense, where NATO threatens us. Uh, so any state that's so close to us that um, is, is a member of that, that's our neighbor rather, that's a member of that alliance is a threat. So that is the implicit argument of self-defense. But that argument uh, cannot work. It's one of those things you would say, um, the, the, the mind, um, you know, mind over matter stuff, something you fear and suspect gets alive that, um, it, it, that reality does not uh, really support. That is what you see there. And why is that? This is because if the argument is that an abutting state, it cannot be aligned with NATO. If that happens, then that's a direct threat. Well, Russia had lived with that threat since 1949, when Norway, was one of the original uh, founders of NATO. And Norway has an abutting border with Russia. Um, and since 2004, Estonia and Latvia have also been member states of NATO and they are abutting uh, states uh, with Russia. And 1949, the, 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 um, since 1949, there's no evidence that because of abutments of Russia and Norway, Norway being a member state of NATO, that NATO had carried out an aggressive um, conduct against Russia merely because of that. Nor has NATO done that uh, since 2004 when Estonia and Latvia have a member state of uh, NATO. What is more? What is more? There is also the consideration of nuclear deterrence that Russia knows. Russia knows that um, for NATO to embark upon a war with Russia would be effectively 
provoke, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, you know, stoking or unleashing a third world war. And that third world war carried all the risks of a nuclear confrontation. And Russia knows that the NATO countries don't want that. And Russia knows that the NATO, after all, is a capitalist uh, alliance. Uh, capitalists don't want to destroy uh, all the joys and toys they have um, amassed um, over time, merely by provoking a fight that will result, uh, that produce that result. Russia knows that. So Ukraine's membership of NATO, as I said, is nothing more than uh, a narrative, a narrative construct in the minds of Mr. Putin, in my view, that uh, uh, shows that there's more politics of power play than objective reality. So that is um, one argument there, it's just an ego trip, however where you look at it, whether or not, um, you know, no. he meant it as such. Now, the argument is even more feeble in the eyes of international law, given the accepted test of self-defense that has been accepted in international law since the Caroline, call it Caroline Affair or Caroline Incident of 1839, which was a serious diplomatic crisis that nearly resulted in, a, in, a, in an armed conflict, in a war between US and Great Britain in, in Canadian, on Canadian territory, which was then under British rule. The Caroline test insists that, that self-defense can only be anchored on a necessity, a necessity that is instant, overwhelming, and leaving no choice of means and no moment for deliberation. On no view could you say that the mayor, even assuming there's a consummate membership of NATO, um, Ukraine into NATO, that such a consummated membership would result in a necessity of self-defense that's instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment of deliberation, assuming even that that kind of um, uh, reality had um, occurred in respect of Ukraine. You cannot say that because Norway's membership, NATO, did not result in that. Estonia's membership did not, and Latvia's membership did not. Again, that's saying, assuming NATO had in fact really absorbed uh, Ukraine. But here, the remoteness of that possibility is underscored by the fact that Ukraine is not even a member state of NATO and they're only discussing about it. And that discussion has been happening um, for a long, long time, right? Between NATO and, um, and, and, um, and, and Ukraine. So there is no urgency, no necessity of self-defense that's been engaged. Another argument of self-defense that's implicated is the, um, when on the 21st of, of, of February, Four, three, four days before the the, the invasion, twenty uh, first of February. Remember that when already by this date, Russian troops have been um, amassed on the borders of Ukraine, waiting to strike. And on the twenty first, um, Mr. Putin said, "Oh, now I recognize the um, countries of in the Donbas region. This, uh, the, you know, um, breakaways." regions of Luhansk and Donetsk as people's republics. I recognize them and then we're going to sign a treaty of friendship and mutual self-defense with them immediately and then three days later he attacks Ukraine uh, because he said he was protecting uh, you know the, the Donbass uh, breakaway state. The problem with that there are many problems with, with that. First of all, is that section Article 51 of the UN Charter does not recognize that sort of self-defense. 51 recognizes self-defense and collective self-defense of members of the United Nations. Notably, Luhansk and Donetsk are not members of the United Nations. Ukraine is. 
So you can then begin to have an arrangement where that provision embraces or accommodates state A, a member of the United Nations, who attacks state B, another member of the United Nations, asserting collective self-defense with entities within state B that are not members of the United Nations. That is a difficult proposition or in terms of Article 51 of the UN Charter. The second reason why that's a difficult proposition, uh, that claim of collective self-defense with the, uh, the Dumbass breakaway states, is that customary international law has never accepted that and will not. Now, customary international law is defined as a consistent practice of states accepted as law. Now, just imagine what will happen to all the uh, to the world order, given all the civil wars that have been fought and are now being fought in the territories of various states within the UN. You can begin with the American Civil War, right? Um, you can move further home to, to further home to Canada. Uh, the FLQ. Uh, uh, insurrection in, in Quebec, if we may call it that. You can think about the uprisings in, in, in Northern Ireland and a host of civil wars uh, and local insurrections happening in, in times ancient and modern. And by the way, Russia has had its own share of civil war. Now imagine the Putin doctrine of collective self-defense to mean, well, uh, there's this thing happening within a state, then a foreign power basically recognizes an entity within the domain state and then engages in attacking the, the domain state. International law, customer international law um, has not gone that far. And I doubt very much that it will ever get to that point. So those are, again, arguments why the collective self-defense uh, in relation to, to NATO uh, cannot work. Another consideration, the fourth argument, in my view, why, fourth reason why Mr. Putin's uh, NATO factor um, defense cannot, or rather a complaint, cannot justify the invasion of Ukraine, boils down to the matter of motive. International lawyers know this rule. Motive is always irrelevant in criminal law. It's not a defense. It is the same with international criminal law, but international law specifically makes that principle plain in the context of the crime of aggression. In other words, the crime of aggression recognizes no defense of provocation. It recognizes the defense of self-defense, as I explained earlier, but not defense of provocation. Somebody bothered me, there's something I didn't like, therefore I'm going to teach them a lesson or their friends a lesson. That is not a defense in international law vis-a-vis -vis the crime of aggression. And we see this in Resolution 3314, which says that, quote, no consideration of whatever nature, whether political, economic, military, or otherwise, may serve as a justification for aggression. And there are various provisions in international law that make the same point. So the, it boils down really to having um, requiring states to resolve their disputes through peaceful means. Article 33 of the UN Charter says that. And before that, in 1928, the, there was that treaty known as the kellogg Brion Pact. Uh, and the long form name to it is the General Treaty on the Renunciation of War as an instrument of national policy. It requires states, whatever your disputes are, to settle them, settle them, whatever their nature or whatever their origin, they must be settled by peaceful means. Under no circumstances should you use force to settle your disputes. That was a specific requirement in international law. So that obligated Mr. Putin to use the processes of international law and international relations to settle whatever complaints he had in relation to NATO 
and elsewhere. So that argument, again, uh, his NATO argument falls flat for those four reasons. Now, I'm going to need to wrap it up. So after all said and done, the invasion of Ukraine, in my view, exposes certain gaps that need to be filled in international law in order to make it harder for strong man leaders to engage in wars of aggression in future. And it is for us to seek to push for these measures to be taken in, in uh, to, to be taken to minimize the incidents of future wars of aggression. And in doing this, I, I submit that um, we contemplate what it is up to us to do. Uh, we, when we do this, let's think about Edmund Burke's um, hypothesis of unwitting complicity of good men and women in the prevalence of evil. Uh, we remember his famous saying that all that it takes for evil to prevail is for good men and women uh, to do nothing. That's point being, if there's things, if there are things that can be done to prevent or repress evil, and we don't take the trouble to do them, are we then complicit in the resulting evil? That is his broader point. And I do think it is time for us to do more than pound table and um, engage in frenetic words or actions in the heat of the moment to condemn the present invasion, the present crime of aggression, and when it all settles, everybody forgets about it until the next time it happens again. Um, humanity deserves, deserves better than that. It is for those reasons that I do urge that it is time to amend the Rome Statute in the way proposed, allow the General Assembly of the UN to be able to refer cases, including crimes for aggression to the ICC, where it is up to Security Council to do so, and they fail to do so because of the exercise of veto power. Beyond that, to develop international law in a way that enables ordinary citizens to bring civil claims in their own right against heads of state and state, as well as corporations that um, knowingly support or uh, 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 provide logistics for wars of aggression to do so. Individuals need to be able to go after those after the fact and claim uh, their own reparation in their own way, because after every war, after every war, uh, that's usually armistice agreement or peace agreement. It is normal to, well, let me not say normal. It, 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 it does occur, it does occur that one of the terms of that agreement between state and state at the end of a war is to, well, let bygones be bygones. We're not gonna press claims against one another. You see that in the Minsk, in the famous Minsk agreement already. So you can see that happening when all this is done and then leaving the poor people who have been devastated, uh, who possibly not properly accounted for. It is enough to now uh, enable them to be able to look after themselves later on by going after states that um, unleash crimes of aggression or wars of aggression in the future. I'm gonna leave it there for now and thank you very much for, for listening to me thank you very much john uh thank you so much chile very informative talk um so we do have time uh, uh 20 minutes or so for questions um so i invite uh those now um if you're not familiar with